order of service this morning. We'll be reading aloud from Ruth chapter 4, verses 9a and 10a. Uh, Before we start, uh, I may not get the opportunity again for a while to to have the teaching podium. Praise the Lord. It's it's a good thing, good thing. But uh, we've got some others that will will step in for a little while. But... uh, As, as, as you all know, when you are a teenager, uh, your parents and your grandparents, their one of their motivations is to embarrass you. So this morning, I want to embarrass my grandson, Jonathan. He is with us today. And so if you get opportunity, say hello to Jonathan. <laughs> all right, we'll get started. As I said, we'll read. Yep, I'm on. OK, we'll read aloud together. Ruth four. 9a and 10a. <clears throat> then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses today that I have acquired all that belong to Elimelech, and also I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we come to you this morning uh, once again turning in your word to the uh, book of Ruth. (sighs) Father, my mind goes to this morning, the brokenness of people. Father, we are, some of us are broken physically, some of us mentally, emotionally, Father, we're all broken spiritually. Lord, everything in this life has a spiritual root. So, Father, that's where we focus our prayers today. Where we should focus our thoughts is to spiritual matters. Father, there are those of us that have been redeemed, that have been regenerated. And, Father, that brokenness in the spirit of sin, that death, has been replaced with with life. And Father, we praise you that it is in your grace and your mercy that you've brought life. But Father, we're not naive to believe that there's not those that are among us today and that will be among us that do not have that life. Father, that they are still broken in their spirit. Father, we pray for an, a mighty awakening and acting upon them from the Holy Spirit of God this day. Father, we pray that life would be given. Father, we thank you that there is hope. And Lord, as we have studied and gone through the book of Ruth and chapters 1, 2, 3, Father, we have seen many things. And the greatest thing that we've seen thus far, Father, is your hand in all of it and how that you work your will and your ways in life. Father, today... May we, as we finish and close out this book, Father, may you enlighten us today to see your glory. For, Father, it is glorious. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you remember last time we met, we finished up chapter 3. We left Ruth and Boaz. They were in the field. Uh, They awakened before daylight. Boaz was... Concerned with her integrity. Uh, He was concerned with her well-being. They both, as we observed, were persons of valor, persons of integrity. And uh, him as such did not want to send her home empty-handedly and send her home with with grain for for Naomi. Uh, But we left off with Boaz telling Ruth that there was a closer kinsman. She had laid down at his feet and asked him to marry her, and he said he would, but he wanted to go about it in the right way. And there was a closer kinsman. So when we left the story, it was at a cliffhanger. So let's see what... I know we all know, but... Sounds good anyway. Let's see what happens today, all right? All right? So I'm sure that 
Ruth went home and Naomi said, tell me, tell me, what happened, what happened? And, and, and Ruth explained to her what was going on and what had happened, what had occurred, but I, I'm sure that she was very nervous. And Naomi, uh, in her wisdom and being a little older, said, calm down, calm down. Shh, it's going to be okay. We'll pray about it. Boaz, he was going to locate this closer kinsman redeemer. He did not hesitate in his actions. Naomi even alluded to as much. He will take care of the matter. And he did. He did immediately. He did not wait for days or hours. As soon as daylight arrived, he went straight away to the place where he was most likely to run into this closer kinsman. We pick up here in Ruth chapter 4. We'll read verses 1 and 2. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the kinsman redeemer whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, my fellow, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Then he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. We see that Boaz straight away went to the gate, the gate of the city. This gate was a place where the esteemed and honorable men of the city would sit. For an ancient city like Israel, in Israel, uh, it was a combination of a city council chamber and a courtroom. The city gate was a kind of outdoor court, the place where judicial matters were resolved by the elders and those who had earned the confidence and respect of the people. A place of business is a kind of forum or meeting place. Verse 1 tells us the kinsman redeemer of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. Now this man came by the, by the city gates as Boaz sat there. Boaz was waiting for him to pass by. We're not sure the scripture doesn't tell us how long he had to sit there, but he was determined. He sat there until he passed by. And as, a, as here again, as we have seen throughout the book of Ruth, we, we see yet again God's providence prevailing. And I'm sure as this man passed by, Boaz caught him by surprise. He told him, he said, turn aside and in my version, it says, my fellow, sit down here. Literally, in the ancient Hebrew, when the Boaz was greeting him, greeting the near kinsman redeemer, the text reads, Mr. So-and-so. That's the, that's the closest translation, Mr. So-and-so. The writer of Ruth never intended the name of the nearer kinsman, uh, never intended it there because he was not worthy of honor. He had declined to fulfill his obligation as the nearer kinsman. This is a quote from a Hebrew historian. He said, doubtless Boaz both knew his name and called him by it but it is omitted by the holy writer, partly because it was unnecessary, number one, to know it, and principally in the way of contempt, as is usual, and just as punishment upon him, that he who would not preserve his brother's name might lose his own and lie buried in the grave of perpetual oblivion. Mm-hmm. As I understand, it wasn't an obligation, but it was something that was strongly recommended. You could decline. You could decline, yes. So, so but you know, it, I, I've heard somebody say perhaps this man who shot her was betrothed. Perhaps he wasn't financially solid and thought this would draw. Perhaps he had young children and thought this was going to take away from their inheritance. It could have been a lot of reasons. But nevertheless, 
strongly recommended. It was. And, and, and when, you, when you alluded to his age being younger, look at, look at Boaz and his age. He was older, and yet the, the closer kinsman logically could have been Boaz's age or a little older or closer in, in relation and still younger. But, uh, yeah, what I've, what, I've, yeah, what I've been able to gather is he was, he just failed to meet his obligation that was asked of him to, to do, which we know as the story tells us, it's all in the providence of the Lord. Ruth, uh, verses 3 and 4, it says, Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the fields of Moab and had to sell a portion of the field which belonged to, her, to our brother Elimelech, so I thought to uncover this matter in your hearing, saying, Acquire it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if no one redeems it, tell me that I may know. For if there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you, and he said, I will redeem it. Verse 3, the kinsman redeemer, Boaz explains that Moab, or I'm sorry, that Naomi had returned from the fields of Moab. The duty of a redeemer, the duty of a goel, the kinsman redeemer was more than a duty to preserve the family's name of his brother in Israel. It was also to keep the land allotted to members of the clan and keep it within that clan. When Israel came into the promised land during the days of Joshua, the land was divided among the tribes and then among the family groups. God intended that the land stay within those tribes and within those family groups so that the land could never perpetually or, or uh, the land could never permanently be sold. Every 50 years, it had to be returned to the original family group. This is explained in Leviticus chapter 25. But 50 years is a long time. So God made provisions that the land was sold that it might be redeemed back to the family by a kinsman redeemer. So in this situation, we see that the harvest was over and Naomi and Ruth had no source of income to live. So Naomi had to sell her property. Again, here, just as a reminder, the kinsman redeemer had the responsibility to protect the person, the property, and the posterity of the larger family and all the duties that went together with that. We see here that Boaz says the portion of the field. Boaz started out mentioning just the field. He mentions just the property to this nearer kinsman. The terms here are strictly about property. Then he asked him, do you plan to redeem it? And he said, I will redeem it. Of course he said he would redeem it. It's land. <laughs> Lord's not making any new land every day. Oh. <clears throat> Just as, as today, and probably more so in that time, land was very valuable. I'm sure that Boaz here was expecting this response. So Mr. So-and-so was willing to increase his land and possibly inheritance for his family. Ruth 5, then Boaz said, on the day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the woman of whom, the woman, I'm sorry, let's start over. On the day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the one who had died, in order to raise up the name of the one who had died on behalf of his inheritance. So here he tells him that you must also acquire Ruth, the Moabitess. 
Boaz told him that he was not only dealing with Naomi and the property of Elimelech, he also had to deal with Ruth. Because Naomi was older and beyond the years of childbearing, the near kinsman was not expected to marry Naomi and raise up children to the family name of her deceased husband Elimelech, but Ruth was another matter. She was able to marry and she was able to bear children. Her late husband's name was to be carried on. This is something important to note. If Ruth was to have a son, this son was to receive the inheritance of his father, Malon, as well as the inheritance of the new kinsman redeemer. Verse 5, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow. Boaz explained what everyone knew, that this was a package deal. If someone was going to exercise the right of a kinsman redeemer towards the deceased Elimelech, he had to fulfill the duty in regard to both the property and posterity. Because of Boaz's wise way of framing this occasion, this was the first time the nearer kinsman considered this, I'm sure. And it was a pretty big question, yeah, to take in all at once. Uh, when it was just a matter of property, it was easy to decide. But, it, but when it was taking Ruth as a wife, this was another matter. Verse 6. So the kinsman redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. He said, I cannot redeem it for myself. No. No, sir, we're not really, we're not really told as... Brother Paul alluded to there could be a myriad of reasons why that he turned it down. Well, yeah, I mean, that's obvious, but there's a multitude of reasons why he would say it in that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Though it would be great to receive the property associated with Ruth, the near kinsman knew that taking her into his home and raising her children would ruin his own inheritance. And he said as such, lest it ruin my inheritance. Uh, There's a possibility that he had grown sons uh, that had already received and inherited some land. The problem then would be dividing up the inheritance among future children. I don't know. I, I, I never found that in... I, didn't, I, I don't think so in that, uh, as, you, as you just said, reputation, that everyone had been watching her. I mean, they watched how she conducted herself with Naomi, and it's a pretty small-knit clan. I mean, everyone knew everyone, and they had been watching her, you know, in the field and the way that uh, she acted uh, respectfully to Naomi, the way that she worked hard in the fields, the way that Boaz and Boaz's foreman had spoken about her. It's a possibility, Brother David, it sure is a possibility that because she was not, uh, she was a foreigner. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. And, and it, you know, she was, she was fulfilling and, and carrying out the duties of a, of a traditional Israelite at that time. So he goes on in, in, in verse 6, he says, You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now just a moment before, all seemed lost when the nearer kinsman had said that he would redeem it. But Boaz's plan had a surprise and an unexpected wisdom to it, and it worked. The nearer kinsman declined. Verses 7 and 8. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the right of redemption and the exchange of land to establish any matter. 
a man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the manner of attestation in Israel. The kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, Acquire this for yourself. And he removed his sandal. It says that this was the custom in former times. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, this describes this ceremony in detail and, and how it was to be to conducted. The kinsman that declined his responsibility, the one declining it, removed his sandal. Also, the woman that he declined to honor was to spit in his face. But in this case, we see just the part of the ceremony involving the sandal. Stephen, I have an interesting question. Because every couple time we've read this, I just wonder, like, what, what if this guy like wore a 12 and this guy wore a 6? <laughs> I really you know, consider that. I'm like, did they like take the sandal and walk home with it or did they like, put it on? You know? <laughs> Maybe this will... Let, let me elaborate a little bit more about the about the sandal. It, it was it was ceremonially discussed here in Deuteronomy how that was to be conducted. And it was also a sign that the man declining would never tread on that property. And so in that sense, he would relinquish his shoe as a ceremonial gesture that he was declining to redeem the land that his foot would never trod on that land. So he, he was relinquishing the property and giving his sandal to him, not that he would actually put the sandal on, but it was, it was symbolic that now my shoe can't tread, but I give it to you so that you can exercise that right and tread on that property. Is that? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Does it like have any relation to now it's an insult? Like you see in a lot of Muslim countries take their shoes off and when they insult you, they'll throw a shoe at you. Oh, I don't know about that. I... <laughs> it's like a, Is like, it? It's like a, you know, overseas, it's like a real big deal. <laughs> you know, so when throws the hill or the shoe at you, it's like an insult. It's like spit in the face here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on to, to, to 9 and 10. It says, Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses today that I have acquired all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Malon from the land of Naomi. And also I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the one who had died and on behalf of his inheritance, so that the name of the one who had died will not be cut off from his brother's or from the gate of his birthplace, you are witnesses today. Boaz said to the elders and all of the people there, Boaz joyfully proclaimed, legally sealing this transaction, that he would redeem both, what did we talk about? The property and the posterity of Elimelech and take Ruth, the person, the woman he loved, as his wife. So we see just in that one statement, he is fulfilling his role as a kinsman redeemer. He is sealing this transaction. Verse 9 tells us that the witnesses today have acquired all that belong. He, he was saying this before the witnesses. This is a good description of the idea of preserving the posterity of the deceased. Now, my mind goes to, you know, when we were talking about the insulted lady there spitting in his face and all, that did not occur. But in my mind's eye, I see them standing near the gate, Naomi and Ruth. Come on, Ruth, come on, let's go see what happens. And they were standing there, they were watching. Huh? I see, I see, I see it kind of playing out like a movie. And, and upon hearing this... I see, I see Ruth running around the corner hearing this announcement from Boaz and she runs into his arms and they hug and embrace. Huh? 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, and he announces as he hugs her, you know, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess. Now back in, in chapter 1 of Ruth, we, Ruth seemed to be giving up on her chance chances of, of marriage by leaving her native land of Moab and, and giving her heart and her life to the God of Israel. But as Ruth followed God, He brought her together in a relationship greater than she could have ever imagined. Young ladies, today God will bless those wanting to marry in the same way if they will follow Ruth's example of trusting in God. He will guide your path. Don't trust in your heart. <laughs> trust in the Lord. Yeah, we have a nuance here. Um, priests were not to marry outside of Israel. The common people were not to marry certain other people specifically. There was other ones like the Moabs that wasn't specifically said you cannot marry that. But really, you probably should uh, but the Moabites, the Moabites, the Moabites were, were not excluded from intermarriage. Hmm. So point, point that out. There was no sin that he did in doing this, right? Because he had married one of the Amorites, for instance. Absolutely true, and I, I mean, I did not bring that out, but yeah, the Moabites were not were not specified as as you said. Yes. That's a little nuance in here that we shouldn't miss. God's plans are often not, we pick it out, we get it all worked out, and just that little detail, just that little God's I got my own way, I'm going to do it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the providence of the Lord prevails. Yeah. In verse 10, he says, You are witnesses today. This explains why marriage ceremony is important and why it should be recognized by civil authorities. Boaz had a love for Ruth that was public, a love that wanted to be publicly witnessed and registered. Sometimes people wonder why marriage ceremonies uh, or a marriage license is important. Can't we just marry before God? but there's something severely lacking in a love that does not want to proclaim itself publicly, that does not want witnesses, that does not want the bond of recognition by the civil authorities. That love falls short of marital love. A while back when we were speaking of covenant, the wedding ceremony was a picture of covenant between two people. They were to take public vows. If you remember, there was uh, the pastor, the two people, and then you had groomsmen, bridesmaid, and then you had a crowd of witnesses to witness this covenant ceremony. That's what I said to the bridesmaids. <laughs> oh, they were to take public vows. They were to pronounce blessings upon one another, and they were held accountable by this crowd of witnesses, by the bridesmaids, and especially, that's why these two people are here as the maid of honor and as the as the best man they are they know the couple better than anyone and they are to hold them accountable that's why you have it publicly I never thought of the symbolism it's like the family of god the individuals of god and then under god mm -hmm. so i don't know if that was the original intent but that's certainly the symbolic look oh there's there's yeah there's a myriad of symbolism there. 
verses 11 and 12, it says, And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May Yahweh grant the woman who is coming uh, into your home be like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel, and so shall you, so shall achieve excellence in Ephrah, and shall proclaim your name in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the seed which Yahweh will grant you this young woman. All the people at the gate and the elders were witnesses. No doubt the crowd was cheering. Everyone could see what a romantic, loving occasion this was. Here stands Boaz and and Ruth and the crowd is chanting, we are, we are witnesses. We see this. It says, may Yahweh grant the woman who is coming in your home to be like Rachel and Leah. The people began to announce blessings upon them. This is a reflection as we spoke about when we were talking about covenant in the children of Israel. If you remember back in Deuteronomy chapter 27, the children of Israel were led out of captivity and stood on Mount Gerizim and announced blessings. And another group stood on Mount Ebal and announced curses. Here we see once again the people of Israel practicing this with announcing blessings. These two, Rachel and Leah, had 13 children between them and their mothers and were the mothers of the whole nation of Israel. This was a huge blessing to pronounce over Boaz and Ruth. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez. What was special about Perez, the story is in Genesis 38. A quote here, may your house be like the house of Perez, the the breach maker as the maidwife called him, because he would need to be born before his brother and carried away the first birthright and afterwards became happy and numerous and honorable posterity. Indeed, it seems that Perez was the ancestor of the Bethlehemites in general, uh, And moreover, Perez gave his name to the section of the tribe of Judah that descended from him, as explained in Numbers. Ruth, verse 13, so Boaz, Ruth 4, 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and Yahweh granted her conception and she gave birth to a son. Hang on a minute, hang on. What just happened here? It was a wedding. <laughs> huh? We should have had an entire chapter about just the wedding, right? Right? No. This story is not a typical romance story. It's much, much, much more. There was no need for the writer to go into detail about the wedding ceremony. Don't get me wrong, ceremonies and wedding ceremonies are very important. But how many times has, have you visited with your, your mother or your, your elderly grandmother and tell me about your, your life, what's going, what, you know, tell me something about yourself. And she, well, let me tell you about my wedding ceremony. No, most of the time not. It is a high point, it is, and it is something to be celebrated and remembered. But it's just, it, it's just a wedding. There's so much more to life. Says... She gave birth to a son. The gift of children was never taken for granted in Israel. The fact that Boaz and Ruth were able to raise up a son to the deceased Elimelech was further evidence of God's blessings. Verses 14 through 16. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is Yahweh who has not left you without a kinsman redeemer today. And may his name be proclaimed in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of your soul and sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. 
Then Naomi took the child and put her to his, to her bosom, put him to her bosom, and became his nurse. The women here bless is Yahweh. We see here women of the town pronouncing blessings. They pronounce blessings over the entire family. We should take a lesson here and be pronouncing blessings over our families and our loved ones. Is this not the same Naomi in chapter 1 that said the Almighty had dealt bitterly with her? That the Lord had brought her home again empty? The Lord had testified against her? If only Naomi could have seen then how, the, how great the Lord would bless her in the end. Naomi took the child to her bosom. God blessed Naomi with a grandson. How blessed are grandchildren. Finally, finishing out the chapter, verses 17 through 22. The neighbor women gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez became the father of Hezron, and Hezron became the father of Ram, and Ram became the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab became the father of Nashon, and Nashon became the father of Selma, and Selma became the father of Boaz, and Boaz became the father of Obed, and Obed became the father of Jesse. Jesse became the father of David. And the father of Jesus. Father of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. A son has been born to Naomi. The son of Ruth, Boaz, was named Obed. A son named Jesse had a son named David, and David had a descendant named Jesus. This is a quote. God's hand is all over history. God works out his purposes generation after generation. Limited as we are to one lifetime, each of us sees so little of what happens. A genealogy is a striking way of bringing before us the continuity of God's purposes through the ages. The purposes of history is not haphazard. There is a purpose in all, and the purpose is the purpose of God. In the book of Ruth, we've seen tragedy, we've seen providence, we've seen redemption, we've seen restoration. Now we're going to take a quick look at our eternal kinsman redeemer and see glorification. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer, our Goel Hadam, our blood redeemer. The kinsman redeemer had to be a family member, not just a family member, but a blood relative. Jesus took on humanity to his eternal deity so he could be our kinsman and save us. Philippians 2, 6 and 7, who although existing in the form of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and being made in the likeness of men. The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying family members out of slavery. Jesus redeemed us from our slavery to sin. Romans 6, 20 through 23, for you were slaves of sin. You were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then having from the things uh, of which you are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you have your benefit, leading to sanctification and the end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The kinsman redeemer had to be willing. Boaz was willing to redeem Christ 
was willing to redeem. The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying back land that had been forfeited. Jesus will regenerate and redeem the earth. The kinsman redeemer had the, had the resources, had to have the resources to redeem. The impeccability doctrine of Christ shows us Christ could not sin. Therefore, He had the resources. He had the qualifications to redeem. Boaz, as a kinsman redeemer to Ruth, was not motivated by self-interest, but motivated by love for Ruth. Jesus' motivation for redemption for us is His great love for us. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates in His own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Boaz, a kinsman redeemer to Ruth, took her as his bride. The people of Jesus, the elect has, as redeemed are collectively called His bride. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to the church, to Christ and the church. Revelation 21, 9, Then one of the seven angels who, who have the seven bowls of the seven uh, last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. The kinsman redeemer had to follow through with the redemption. Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath. He hung on the cross between heaven and earth. Boaz, a kinsman redeemer to Ruth, provided a glorious destiny, a future for Ruth. Jesus, as our kinsman redeemer, provides a glorious future for us. Psalms 41, 13. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Thank you. You're dismissed. Mm-hmm. <laughs>